Thou shalt call his name Jesus. When a person is dear, everything connected with him becomes dear for his sake. Thus so precious is the person of the Lord Jesus in the estimation of all true believers that everything about him they consider to be inestimable beyond all price. All thy garments smell of myrrh and alloys and cassia, said David, as if the very vestments of the Saviour were so sweetened by his person that he could not but love them. Certain it is that there is not a spot where that hallowed foot hath trodden. There is not a word which those blessed lips have uttered, nor a thought which his loving word has revealed, which is not to us precious beyond all price. And this is true of the names of Christ. They are all sweet in the believer's ear. Whether he be called the husband of the church, her bridegroom, her friend. Whether he be styled the lamb slain for the foundation of the world, the king, the prophet, or the priest. Every title of our master, Shiloh, Emmanuel, Wonderful, the Mighty, Counselor, every name is like the honeycomb dripping with honey, and luscious are the drops that distill from it. But if there be one name sweeter than another in the believer's ear, it is the name Jesus. Jesus is the name which moves the harps of heaven to melody. Jesus, the life of all of our joys. If there be one name more charming, more precious than another, it is this name. It is woven into the very warp and woof of our psalmody. Many of our hymns begin with it, and scarcely any that are good for anything and without it. It is the sum total of all delights. It is the music with which the bells of heaven ring, a song and a word, an ocean for comprehension. Although a drop for brevity, a matchless oratorio, and two syllables, a gathering up of the hallelujahs of eternity in five letters. Jesus, I love thy charming name. Tis music to mine ear. He shall save his people from their sins. Many persons, if they are asked what they understand by salvation, will reply, Being saved from hell and taken to heaven. This is one result of salvation, but it is not one tithe of what is contained in that boon. It is true our Lord Jesus Christ does redeem all his people from the wrath to come. He saves them from the fearful condemnation which their sins had brought upon them. But his triumph is far more complete than this. He saves his people from their sins. O oh, sweet deliverance from our worst foes! Where Christ works a saving work, he casts Satan from his throne, and will not let him be a master any longer. No man is a true Christian if sin reigns in his mortal body. Sin will be in us. It will never be utterly expelled till the Spirit enters glory, but it will never have dominion. There will be a striving for dominion, a lusting against the new law and the new spirit which God has implanted, but sin will never get the upper hand so as to be absolute monarch of our nature. Christ will be master of the heart, and sin must be mortified. The line of the tribe of Judah shall prevail, and the dragon shall be cast out. Professor, is sin subdued in you? If your life is unholy, your heart is unchanged. And if your heart is unchanged, you are an unsaved person. If the Savior has not sanctified you, renewed you, given you a hatred of sin and a love of holiness, he has done nothing in you of a saving character. The grace which does not make a man better than others is a worthless counterfeit. Christ saves his people, not in their sins, but from them. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If not saved from sin, how shall we hope to be counted among his people? Lord, save me now from all evil and enable me to honor my Savior.